folks, and welcome or welcome back to NTI's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again, and this podcast is brought to you, among others, by Native Shark, which is an online platform for learning Japanese. And what Native Shark do is they make learning Japanese really, really simple. You log in, you click a button that says study now, and the platform then shows you exactly what you need to learn next based on your previous progress. Now, again, this is simple, but the way it's designed means that students who use Native Shark once a day for four to five months can complete the equivalent of over two years of university study. And this is not just、um, them patting themselves on the back. Now that Native Shark's been in business for over a year, the results are in. So, this is exactly what people are saying.、Uh, just looking at a couple of posts in their community forums. And the student community, by the way, is one of the best things about the platform. So, one person's writing, most productive year I've had learning Japanese. And then another one says, I've started learning over a year ago with all of these other platforms, and what I learned there is only a fraction of what I've learned on Native Shark in just three months. And then yet another one goes, In my mind, my study timeline only started with Native Shark because that's when I really started learning consistently, and on and on. So, yet the proof's in the pudding. It's definitely the best online course out there. And since you've heard about it here on the podcast, you also get an extra little bonus. If you sign up for their free trial、uh, using the URL nativeshark.com forward slash NTI, and we'll link to it in this episode's show notes. So that's native without an E. So N A T I V shark, all one word, dot com forward slash NTI. You use that link to sign up and you'll get a double length free trial. So two weeks free instead of just the one. No need to put in your credit card or anything of that sort. You can just sign up, give it a shot. And chances are, at the end of these two weeks, you'll already be far ahead of wherever you are with your Japanese at the moment, whether you're just starting out or you're already in knee deep. Give it a shot. NativeShark.com forward slash NTI. All right. So, first, as usual, brief update on our 10 to 12 December business networking and gaming event here in Fukuoka City.、Um, it's really nice to see you all waking up at the last minute. We've had quite a few bookings come in recently, so we are very happy to have you. And we've also managed to squeeze a bit of an extension from Monica, our Chilean chef, who agreed to let us provide her with the final count of guests、um, who are opting in for the amazing meals inclusive tickets. So you can now book these until 1st December. But I very much doubt we'll get any further extensions from her. So if you're after the room only or attendance only tickets, those are technically available until 8 December. But the hotel has contacted us to let us know that with more people traveling now, rooms are filling up. So while we don't have an official deadline from them yet, they may end up being full by the time you decide to book your stay. So don't dilly dally, book your ticket today. I've also put together and published a、uh, 11 minute video presenting our speakers at the event. So Jason Ball, owner and admin of the Business in Japan Networking Group. Uh, Mario Long, game designer and founder of Sakura Phoenix, and myself, which, if you're tuning into this podcast、uh, or YouTube channel, you're probably already familiar with me. So, check it out. If you're watching this on YouTube, the link to the video、uh, should appear in the top right corner of your screen just about now. And if you're just listening in via the podcast, the link will be in the description or comment section、uh, or in this episode's show notes. Okay, so for today's episode, if you've tuned into our previous episode, which was an interview with Ben Sheeran,、uh, founder and owner of the Retired Japan blog and online community, which is the only real resource out there in English for those of us living or seeking to retire here in Japan, he's also a personal finance coach and he regularly provides free content on this topic as well. So, the first Retired Japan online conference took place this week, last Tuesday, 23rd November. And as expected, it was a huge success. So, today's episode is a recording of my presentation at the conference,、uh, which was obviously all about property investment in Japan. Really, the basics. So, it might be stuff that you're already aware of, but since the speaker before me, Daniel Mills, was talking about property investment in the US, I've kind of bounced off him and focused a bit more on the differences between investing here in Japan as opposed to other、uh, more familiar first world countries like the, the US, Australia, UK, Singapore, and so forth. So, pretty basic stuff, but I did manage to、uh, cram quite a lot of information into that 40 minute presentation. 
I've gone a bit over the original 30-minute uh, allocation, as I do, but from feedback I've received so far, it was quite educational and interesting, so I'm pretty happy with it. I will also link to the other presentations via the conference's webpage in the comments section or video description, as well as in the show notes. So if you're interested in some of the other topics, which were um, all about personal finance, uh, saving for retirement, general investment advice, uh, introduction to the Retire Japan Wiki database, and again, property investment in the US. So feel free to go and watch the entire thing. It doesn't include the Q&A sessions, which were private and off camera. So the presentations themselves should take you maybe just over two hours to watch in total, but well worth it if these topics uh, are close to your heart. So here's my presentation. Again, basically an extended introduction to property investing in Japan. Enjoy, and I'll see you again on the other side. Okay, so the next session, we're going to have Ziv talking about uh, real estate in Japan, which is going to provide an interesting contrast to real estate in the USA, I'm sure. All right, thanks a lot, Ziv. Take it away. Okay, so yeah, um, I, I actually did um, structure the... Uh, the presentation a little bit uh, just bouncing off the, a lot of the things that Daniel mentioned. I, I had the uh, privilege of seeing his uh, presentation beforehand. So rather than go into the um, the basics of why real estate investing uh, might be attractive to some particular types of investors and what the advantages and disadvantages of real estate versus other investments is, um, I'm going to assume that between um, Daniel's presentation and what Ben uh, Ben's presentation at the start, um, you've probably got a rough idea of why you might be interested in real estate if you haven't had uh, a rough idea of that before. So I'll try to focus more on the um, differences and the challenges and the advantages and disadvantages of investing in Japan um, as opposed to investing uh, overseas, whether it's in the US or in any other country. But we will touch a little bit about the US as well. So firstly, just a little bit about me. Um, first of all, you can tell from the presentations that I'm... Um, not as creative. I don't have beautiful slides. I'm very much the, um, like Ben was mentioning at the start, some people just love Excel sheets. So that's me. I'm the uh, geeky type. I love just focusing on the next deal and crunching numbers and outsourcing as much work as possible, as much physical work as possible to, um, to our team members, whether it's property managers, real estate contractors, everything that Daniel was mentioning before. Um, so I've sort of married into the country like a lot of us did back in 2003, was coming and going, still living in Australia at the time, originally from Israel, but I've migrated to Australia in my late 20s. Um, so my introduction to Japan was while I was living in Australia. And then um, I've started investing here together with my wife, who is also my business partner in 2011, while we were still um, living in Australia at the time. Um, and after we've invested in a few deals um, for our own portfolio, we kind of recognize that um, due to all of the factors that I'll mention as we go, we sort of recognize that there might be a lot of people out there who could use a hand um, doing the same thing, whether they're here in Japan or remotely. And um, so we set up shop, uh, buyers advocacy. We're not a real estate agency. We're not a property management company. What we do is represent at the beginning, only investors these days, uh, we also do holiday homes, land for development, commercial properties, and so forth. But we basically represent our clients um, as their Japanese uh, face or uh, their Japanese representative in front of all of these third parties. So we deal with the real estate agents, with the property management companies, and any other third party. So building management companies, renovation repair professionals, insurance companies, in some cases, uh, depending on whether the client is living in Japan or overseas, we might also represent them in front of their accountant. So because we've got all of their data on hand for management, then they can just give us authority to deal with the accountant on their behalf. And then we'll also liaise with them um, and pay their taxes. Um, as most of you living in Japan probably know, often paying any sort of bill in Japan involves actually physically going to a convenience store or the post office or the bank and paying that bill. So we do obviously that as well. Most of our customers reside overseas uh, because they're the ones who really need help, but 20% of them or so are actually living in Japan and just don't have the bandwidth or the inclination or the language skills or just can't be bothered um, to deal with real estate on their own. So they outsource it to us to various degrees. So obviously if somebody's living in Japan, they've got their own bank account, they'll be able to receive their rental income 
and in most cases pay their expenses on their own, but everything else, again, dealing with the third parties, looking for the next investment, um, providing advice on what needs to be done as the next step and so forth, they outsource to us. And for investment purposes, again, we do holiday homes and other stuff as well, but for investment purposes, our focus has always been, and a lot of that is just derived from the way Japan's real estate market is, um, affordable, high-yielding, and hassle-free investments. And the reason we focus mainly on these things is because these are really um, the three core advantages that people who invest in Japan are looking for. So uh, the, the fact that properties here are very affordable is due to the fact that Japan's, um, as you probably well know, has had two and a half decades or so of deflation. Uh, the bubble burst here in the early 90s property prices started trending down. There wasn't a huge crash, and that's for various macroeconomic reasons um, in the sense that there were no bank crashes or tires burning in the street or people losing jobs or, or um, defaulting on their mortgages and so forth. But there has been a significant price drop that's slowly trended down all the way up to uh, late 2012-ish when Abe came into his um, second stint. And even though... Many locations such as um, central Tokyo, central Osaka, and particularly hot spots like uh, Niseko up in Hokkaido and so forth, some of these areas have recovered, at least pre-COVID, have recovered to their pre-bubble price, but the vast majority of the country is still very, very affordable. And what that gives us as investors is diversity. So diversity comes in, in, in two flavors. One means that we can spread our investments geographically and socioeconomically. Uh, geographically in Japan is particularly important because of the uh, tendency here, um, the frequency of mainly earthquakes, but also occasionally other natural disasters. It is important not to put all your eggs in one basket geographically. And socioeconomically, meaning um, particular Townships and cities can be more blue collar, more white collar, younger, a little bit older, uh, more transient population, less transient population, and various industries. So the more affordable the properties are, the more we can diversify them. And um, probably another kind of a kind of a side bonus, but if I've got a single asset versus 10 assets that I've spread the same budget over. Obviously, if and when a tenant moves out, I've lost a portion of my income stream. Whereas if I'm holding a single asset or two assets for that same budget, tenant moves out, that's my income stream down by 50 or 100%. So these are all um, the advantages that affordability gives us. Um, stability. So Japan is a very, very stable market, both financially um, from an economic perspective and as far as legal recourse goes. So... Everything here has a paper trail, as you probably well know, a thousand miles long. There's always legal recourse. Um, even if companies or individuals uh, declare bankruptcy or go out of business, it's very unlikely that they're going to disappear off to the Bahamas with your cash. It doesn't happen here, both on a mentality level and also on a legal level. They just don't really have the option and most of them would never pursue such an option. The cash flow compared to a first world country is quite high. So similar to what Daniel was describing in the US, um, cash on cash. So we mainly deal in cash purchases and I'll get into that in a little bit, but assuming a cash purchase, you can definitely generate uh, a net pre-tax yield of seven or 8% in Japan. It's very doable. So for, the, for a first world country, that's quite high. If you look at um, Australia, for example, New Zealand, um, Singapore, Hong Kong, places that are considered um, quite advanced uh, in their governance and in their uh, sort of uh, mature economic markets, that's quite high cash flow. Um, the market here is not speculative. So again, like Daniel was mentioning, Japan is not a place where you would buy and bank on any capital growth. So we have seen a few good years, um, again, from 2013 or so and all the way up to COVID hit. But generally speaking, and especially if you look at the uh, last three or four decades, you wouldn't necessarily assume that your property here would gain in value. Uh, the market is usually, again, barring some particular times and particular locations, usually stagnant uh, property price-wise. Again, central Tokyo, central Osaka, notwithstanding. 
Um, there are other places like Fukuoka, for example, which only sort of came on the map um, about seven, eight years ago, started becoming familiar, gaining um, wildly in value, still a lot lower than Tokyo and Osaka, but has more room to grow as well. But generally speaking, property prices here tend to stay the same. And because of the way that properties are built here, uh, especially the wooden structures or the steel framed wooden structures, um, the structure itself uh, doesn't tend to retain its value as well, which is again, a bit of a headwind. So your, your land value might occasionally, depending on the time and the location, gain in value, but your structure will always be depreciating rather quickly. And the asset classes of choice here, which again is a little bit different um, to the States and some of the other markets that uh, some of you might be more familiar with, mainly condo units, uh, mansions, um, apartos, so the, the smaller, usually again, wooden or steel framed wood apartment blocks of up to six, let's say, or 10 units, um, and various commercial properties, which can be, again, uh, for example, ground floor shops in both aparto uh, buildings or mansion, bigger concrete buildings, or they could be um, logistics facilities, warehouses, and so forth. Those are mainly the popular uh, asset classes for investment. And the reason that it's usually not family homes or duplexes like you'd see in other countries is uh, mainly, again, because of the light uh, building materials that they use here and the fact that these structures uh, depreciate rather quickly, these wooden single family homes or duplexes tend to, once they reach about 20, 25 years of age, the maintenance costs tend to pile up rather quickly. And also with Japan's demographics, the just the fact that people are not having that many babies here and the population is... Um, rapidly declining and that's probably going to be the case unless there's some major policy or mind shift um, in the ne next few decades but as long as people are not having babies and less and less uh, people are getting married singles or couples with no children uh, tend to be the easiest tenant base to tap into in Japan so if you have a family home you can get a tenant but it will take you a lot longer to find a tenant whereas if you're looking for a single person um, or perhaps a couple, then it's a lot easier to quickly populate a property. And um, those people tend to go for, again, condo units or apartments, not for single family homes usually. Okay, so we've mentioned uh, cash flow and diversity. So ju just to give you an idea of the numbers, um, we're talking about an entire property that you own yourself. So land is mostly freehold in Japan, even if you own a unit in a condo block in a mansion or an apartment, you're going to be owning um, a portion of the land, which is going to be divided between all of the unit owners. So freehold apartments um, that are a little bit older and on the smaller side. So usually in Japan, we're referring to the cash cows as something built um, up to 30 or 40 years ago. Um, recently, there's been a bit of a caveat on things older than 30. I'll get to that uh, a little bit later. But generally, let's say at the youngest, they'd be maybe 20 years old. Size-wise, they'd be a, a studio or a single bedroom. So what's known here as a 1R or 1K or maybe as big as a 1DK. So um, one bedroom plus dining kitchen. And these start, depending on the city, again, not central Tokyo, not central Osaka, but these start as low as 2 million Japanese yen. So slightly under uh, 20,000 US dollars can actually get you an apartment that's going to be generating stable rental income on a monthly basis. So that's, again, extremely affordable, which gives you a lot of diversity. Profitable, we've mentioned, again, they can go up to 8% in reliable net pre-tax. Some properties that you'll see advertised, that you might even buy that are generating higher income than that, but that's usually going to be in either a location or a property profile that's not necessarily going to be easy to repopulate, or at least not without some significant expense once it does become vacant. So if we factor in up to seven or 8%, we're usually shopping in markets that are quite reliable. And relatively hassle-free management in the sense that Japan being Japan, your tenants, so like Daniel was mentioning earlier, class A, class B, class C properties. Um, I think he didn't want to dig into uh, class D properties, which in the US, for example, could be outright uh, ghetto properties. But even at class C, if you're talking about working class, blue collar sort of, um, let's say, lower income tenants, which might be 
shift workers or convenience store workers, um, single unemployed or partly employed moms, um, retired or pensioners who don't really have much family support. So not quite destitute, but, but very close to that. Even these very low income earners in Japan are never problematic. So payment issues, while they can occur in Japan, are not as severe as they are in other places. And even on the rare occasion that that sort of thing does happen, and even if you've bought in a very blue collar neighborhood, and even if the person is unemployed or on government pension of some sort, whether it's a retirement pension or it's a, just a disability pension and so forth, they're never a problem in the sense that in a worst case scenario in Japan, at least for residential properties and usually for commercial as well, the worst you would have to do with a problem tenant is send them a strict letter of warning. And then if they um, err again, you send them another letter a month later asking them to move out and off they go. So there's not going to be squatters. You're not going to have to take them to court, no forced evictions. Sometimes they kind of disappear, in which case it's quite easy within a couple of months to get a court order to enter the property and see if there's any, anybody still there. And if not, just take ownership again. The only complication might be in cases of uh, inheritance. If a person died in the property, we can get to that a little bit later, but it's a hassle-free environment on the tenant side. They also tend to stay a lot longer. Again, Japanese being Japanese, they prefer to have as few as possible changes to their life over the course of many years. So it's very common here to see a tenant in place eight, 10, 15, even 20 or more years. And there's a downside to that, which is um, you can't really raise the rent as long as the economy stays as it is, which we'll get to in a minute. But the stability of having the same tenant in place for such an extended period of time um, from an investor's perspective, especially against somebody like um, me and other people who don't like to be constantly involved and constantly making decisions about their portfolio um, is a real boon. And the other side of the hassle-free uh, management uh, equation, if you will, is the fact that the professional companies that you work with here as well are very, very by the book. So they might not all be super, um, super professional or, or, you know, extremely good at what they do. You might have to prod them. They're not very proactive, which again is a, I guess, a Japanese mentality thing, but they're never going to, again, just disappear with your money or fail to perform their duties in, in a gross, neglectful manner or, um, you know, go bankrupt and disappear altogether. That, that sort of thing just doesn't happen here. Insurance companies as well, owner unions of, of co-owned blocks, any of the professional entities that you deal with on a regular basis are pretty much by the book. Again, super documented. They don't um, have their hand in their pocket trying to get some extra fees from you. If you miss a payment, they're not going to hit you with a, a double extra interest payment because you've uh, missed that. It just doesn't happen here. So again, relatively headache-free and extremely easy to manage on a regular basis. So the downsides. Uh, we've mentioned capital growth potential, virtually unknown. Lovely if it happens, but that should be treated as icing on the cake. Nothing that you would probably be banking on when you purchase a property here. Um, the aging and declining population. So I like to think about that as the um, maybe the counter argument to the crime uh, crime debate. So in other countries, when you're investing in, again, these cash cows or these cheaper cheaper properties for lower income tenants, you're always thinking about um, crime-ridden areas, how likely it is that you're going to have legal challenges, how likely it is that you're going to have to um, deal with payment issues. That doesn't happen here, but what does happen here is that you've got... Um, a large portion of the of the um, population, which are going to be your tenant base, who are quite aged. And that can be non-problematic in some cases. So for example, age or gender-wise, if you've got a, a lady in her late 50s or early 60s or even late 60s, um, she's probably been living in the same place for 20 or 30 years, she's going to be taking very good care of the property and she's going to be taking pretty good care of her health. So when it's time to check into a nursing home or a hospital, she'll know it in advance and she'll take care of it and she'll take care to leave the property in good condition. 
if you're dealing with somebody, for example, who's um, single male, late 70s, early 80s, which are a lot of your tenants here uh, for these lower end properties, um, they've got other behavioral patterns for one. So for example, a lot of them are heavy smokers. A lot of them uh, never opened the windows to their apartments. They've been living in the same room for 20, 30 years, smoking heavily. They don't really have the um, um, hygiene factor of taking care of removing mold from the bathroom or making sure that the place is aired once in a while or notifying the property manager. They, they prefer not to communicate with anyone, so they don't communicate with the property manager much as well. So they wouldn't let you know if anything's deteriorated in the apartment. And if one of these tenants uh, moves out, which is usually going to be to a nursing home or a hospital again, or in, in a worst case scenario, if they happen to pass away, whether it's in the property or out of the property while they're in hospital, you might find, especially after an extended tenancy, that the place is in complete disrepair. Um, again, it's neglect. It's not any willful or accidental damage, but it, it is something that needs to be paid for and taken care of. And if they do end up dying in the property, Insurance does cover you for um, a very large portion of that if you get landlord insurance, but it's a hassle. So you have to um, hire special cleaning companies to take care of that. There's a particular um, Buddhist ceremony, I think, that needs to be performed after a death in the property. And then you need to advertise for the next few years to let people know that somebody has died in the property. It's not um, as much of a stigma as a, as a accidental or suicide or murder type of death. That fortunately hasn't happened to us yet or to any of our clients. But even if a person has died of natural causes in the property, the insurance will cover you for the renovation and repair uh, up to 1 million yen or so. And they'll also cover you for two years of missing or declined rents afterwards because they do know that for the next tenant in line, at least, you will be charging less, and it will also be a little bit more difficult and take more time to source that next tenant. So that, that's a unique, um, a unique factor that you need to consider when you're investing in Japan. And the third thing is obviously the cultural and language gap. So the language gap, many of us have bridged by um, either you know, becoming fluent in the language or having a, a partner, whether it's a business partner or a life partner who can join them on these transactions. And that's, that helps a lot. But in many other case, cases, if we don't have a partner or our partner doesn't want to be involved in this, even if we do speak the language super fluently and we can read and write kanji and legalese and, and we can answer um, telephone calls in Kago, what have you, just the fact that we are foreigners, so whether it's our name on the email or on the telephone call or our accent or the fact that we've um, met someone face to face and then obviously immediately recognize that we're non-Japanese, that unfortunately still blocks us from having access to a large portion of the market because again, central Tokyo, central Osaka aside where yields are, might not be super attractive, so you might not be interested in those areas. Everywhere else in the country, aside from a few select locations, is still extremely foreigner shy. And it's not just a language thing, it's just um, the natural aversion to dealing with somebody who might have different expectations or different cultural norms. And Japanese being Japanese, they tend to avoid confrontation if they can. So they still um, very often, unfortunately, actively refuse to work with foreigners, whether they're remote or present here. Okay, so a little bit about locations. How are we for time, by the way? Give me a second there. Okay, almost running out. So a little bit about locations and the types of properties that we'd be normally looking into. Um, in Japan specifically, the main factor that we always want to look at because of, again, the demographics is we want to be purchasing in areas that have got um, population growth or at least population stability. Now, Japan being Japan, it's not often going to be organic growth. So it's not necessarily going to be uh, people having babies in those locations. What we will find is that as these smaller townships and villages and so forth um, begin to empty out, and that's, again, that's a trend that's probably going to continue for the next uh, two or three decades at least, unless something changes, um, all of these smaller townships get conglomerated and people move into the bigger um, metropolitan centers in the nearest vicinity or sometimes even further afield. So there's nothing wrong with purchasing in these locations, but you want some sort of stability or growth. You don't want to be purchasing in a place that's losing uh, population rapidly. 
Um, secondly, and that's again, that's applicable to any market anywhere in the world. You want to have an economy that's got at least um, two or three things going for it. So no, no one trick ponies, uh, a place with a single employer or a single, uh, you know, famous only for one particular traditional craft or something of that sort is a place that's relatively high risk factor for anyone because again, obviously economic trends changes, but also again, as places die out, companies relocate to bigger metropolitan centers, employers can leave. If you're purchasing in close proximity, uh, for example, to a US military base, which a lot of people like to do, um, bases do occasionally relocate as well. You don't wanna depend on a single employer or a single uh, industry in that particular town. And obviously, once you factor those two in, you look at the price return ratio. So again, central Tokyo, central Osaka, prices have gone up significantly and now almost back to their pre-bubble uh, days, for example. But rents haven't risen uh, nearly as rapidly. In fact, um, salaries and rents, which go together, have been quite stagnant in Japan over the last 15, 20 years. So if property prices, uh, it's like a double graph sort of thing, property prices go up, uh, rents don't go up, that gap that gets created between the price and the rental income is um, the exact inverse of how shrunk your yield is going to be. So once you've ruled out um, central Tokyo or central Osaka, and I should probably caveat that with the fact that uh, during COVID, it's actually been a little bit better, but in normal times, you factor these and a few other locations out, you make sure that your population is growing or at least stable and that the economy is diversified enough. And then you're left with a list of a few big cities and uh, some profiles of smaller cities that are most attractive for investors uh, on a cash flow perspective. So those cities are usually um, Sapporo, where prices, um, compared to the rest of Japan's bigger cities, prices don't tend to go up quite as sharply. Sapporo was actually losing population a little bit uh, until 2016, 17, but now it's bounced up again. It's a very good city, close to 2 million population wise, um, quite white collar, very diverse industries. Um, the only caveat there is while, while yields can be higher because prices tend to be lower than those other cities there, um, winter takes its toll. So you've got higher maintenance costs uh, due to the harsh winters more heating equipment, which is pretty expensive when it goes. Um, and if you happen to get a vacancy during the colder months, it takes a lot longer to populate. People don't like to move around too much in the snow. And Fukuoka City, again, a rising star. Um, these days, not as attractive as it was when we first went into business about a decade ago now, and because prices have almost doubled here in central areas, but still provides much higher yield than uh, Tokyo and Osaka in most cases. Um, slight caveat to Fukuoka is maybe because the population is very younger, it's actually organically growing here. One of the fewer places in Japan when it still happens, it just means that tenants are more transient. So you get younger tenants, but that also means that they move out more often because their life circumstances changes. They get relocated for work, a lot more students. And once they graduate, they want to move to another city, uh, singles that get married, that sort of thing. And Nagoya, which is quite blue collar, but uh, also quite a good, uh, stable, diverse industry sort of location, um, has been going in price until COVID hit, but now actually uh, took, a huge, uh, took a huge dive. So now is a very good time to hit Nagoya as well, as long as you can uh, prepare yourself to occasionally having more tenant issues than other cities. So again, it is Japan. You're not going to have uh, complete disasters and drug labs and fires and uh, squatters. But if and when we do see payment issues um, or, you know, tenants suddenly canceling mid-lease for any reason, Nagoya does tend to be uh, where it happens a little bit more frequently than in other locations. And that's probably a good point, a good point in time to note that Japan's tenant, uh, tenant laws are uniform across the country. So it's not like in the States when Daniel mentioned, you have to look at each particular area and what's the uh, tenancy laws there. Japan is generally a tenant-oriented uh, legislation infrastructure. So landlords are obliged to the full term of the lease. And in some cases, they're also obliged to renew the lease automatically at the same rent. Tenants, on the other hand, aside from giving you a month or two of, of rental compensation, are basically eligible to move out at any time during their tenancy lease, which is not a huge factor for landlords because Japanese tenants don't like to move out that much, um, but something to keep in mind. 
So then we've got the bigger satellite cities, places around Tokyo and Osaka that are big enough um, to enjoy the same sort of dynamics that those bigger cities enjoy, um, but also are still a little bit more affordable and yield tend to be a little bit higher there. And all of these, again, pretty diverse on industries and uh, types of tenants. And then we've got the real satellite cities and the bedroom communities um, and the smaller cities that might be, um, might be big cities uh, of their own right, but are still considered satellite cities um, because they're in close proximity to another big metropolitan center. So um, if you look, for example, at uh, Saitama, Saitama fits within the prefectural capital, which is the last category there, but it's also very much a bedroom community to Tokyo itself. There are a lot of people who live in Saitama and commute to uh, Tokyo every day. Same thing goes for Kobe. It's a wonderful place to live, Kawasaki again, but it is essentially a satellite city to Tokyo um, for many people and in many aspects. And then you've got the real small satellite cities and bedroom communities. Don't have much of an industry, but they're in such close proximity to a bigger metropolitan center that the population is stable and you're always going to be enjoying a, an influx of tenants. And the prefectural capital. So this could be a city that's maybe out in the sticks, but it's still the major um, the major metropolitan center for that area. So places like uh, Kumamoto down here in Kyushu, um, uh, places like uh, Sendai, for example, uh, where Ben, I think, is from. Um, places like, um, uh, I keep forgetting the name, the two big cities uh, on Shikoku, uh, Matsuyama and I forgot the other one. So prefectural capitals, unless something drastic happens to the economy, will always, again, have relatively stable populations, a good few industries, even if those industries just mean branch offices of bigger companies, quite a few employers available and quite a stable tenant base. So your due diligence, I'll go through this one really quickly. Sorry, I've, um, I've gone overboard, haven't I? So due diligence. Lots of problems there. <laughs> Take as long as you want. Um, if you're buying individual mansion units, so these are the uh, condo units in reinforced concrete blocks, what you want to look at mainly is how much the building has collected in reserve funds. So each unit owner is charged a monthly fee that's going to be composed of a management fee for managing the facilities, gardening, and on-site manager if one exists, you know, lights, water, that sort of thing, and a reserve fund contribution, which goes towards the reserve fund, which will then be used for renovations and major repairs on the structure. You want to correlate that with the renovation history of the building itself, because what happens is there are certain um, big item, big ticket items that need to be carried through carried on every 10 or 15 or 20 years, depending on the age of the building. And if none of it was done in say the last 10 years, but the building has ample reserve funds, that's not a problem because they've got um, the funds to cover when that thing does come along. If um, the renovation history is spec up to date, latest big renovation were, you know, five or six years ago or a couple of years ago, it's okay for the reserve funds to be depleted because it's obviously being used for good purposes and there's no immediate risk barring an earthquake of anything big happening. But if the no renovation history of the last 10 years is not that significant, there's no big items there and the reserve funds pool is depleted as well, there's a very good chance of either mismanagement or just maybe um, not enough fees were being collected on a regular enough basis. Maybe they should have been hiked a long time ago and they haven't. Whatever the reason is, it will result in a, in a building fees hike, which will be quite steep and will most likely come in the near future. And of course, once you pay more monthly expenses, that drastically reduces your yield. So that's something that you want to keep on, keep an eye on and look at that in comparison with the monthly fees that you're paying now. And um, building management, again, whether if there is no renovation history whatsoever, um, or when you ask about it, you sort of get um, responses to say, well, you know, we've just changed building management companies five or six years ago. The previous one was not doing such a good job, but we still haven't received the reports. Might be a little bit of mismanagement there, which can, again, lead to um, constant, uh, just constant hassles with um things that need to be taken care of and are not being taken care of, constant building fee hikes to try and compensate for missing funds. Um, building owner union might suddenly have to take out a loan to do an emergency repair. You just don't want to go into that sort of situation, or at least you want to drastically reduce your offer price to compensate you for that risk if you really like the property for any other reason. And if you're buying the entire structure, which um, sounds expensive, but in Japan is not as expensive as you might think. So there are, for example, 
the small apartos of four, six, eight unit blocks can be purchased for as little as uh, 30, 40 million uh, yen in some very good locations, Yokohama, Fukuoka, some other good cities as well. Um, in those cases, if you are buying the entire structure, you probably want to make sure it's not as old as um, older than 20 years or so, because again, it's a wooden structure and that's when maintenance will start piling up after about 25 years. You want to make sure that there are no building restrictions prohibiting you if and when the building comes crashing, because all structural maintenance is going to be on you. There's no owner union, there's no monthly fees. You want to make sure that you do have the um, permission to build something similar to that size, unless in advance you're planning to turn it into a parking lot when it comes crashing down or something of that sort. You want to make sure if you're planning to be creative, which is something that you can do if you're owning the structure, you can rent um, units out as offices or for short-term stays or, um, you know, convert the bottom, the ground floor into a shop. You want to make sure what the zoning restrictions are just to make sure that you can actually do that sort of thing in that area where you've purchased. And if again, if you own the entire structure, that's not an issue for a big, huge concrete block, but you want to make sure that you're not in a flood or landslide uh, designated zone because if and when that happens, that could result in a total loss of your building. And again, if you're okay with that and you're planning to maybe rebuild in the future anyway, that's okay, but just factor that into your offer price. So speaking of pricing, I think that's my last slide. No, almost. Speaking of pricing. So the market here uh, is priced very differently in properties that are designated specifically owners, occupiers, or versus properties that are strictly investment properties. So owner occupiers, um, there's not, it's not a legal designation, but generally speaking, if you're purchasing uh, one of those older cash cows, one uh, R, one K, one DK in an old um, sort of um, not so attractive building, that's never going to be purchased by somebody who wants to live in it and vice versa. The tenants that are going to be living in it are never going to be able to afford to buy a property on their own. So those types of properties, for example, are usually strictly investment properties. And as opposed to family homes or, you know, bigger condo units that are usually priced on, you know, wherever is popular and what people are willing to pay and what people can afford to pay, investment properties are priced strictly on their yield potential. So if you're buying a property that's been tenanted or it's very easy for the buyer to assume what the rental income is going to be, that's exactly how the property is going to be priced. So you might see two identical properties. One has a tenant that's been, you know, moved in 15 years ago. For some reason, they're still paying uh, pre-bubble rent and they're um, paying a lot more in rent for a completely identical property in the same building. That property that's generating more rental yield will be priced higher than the other, even though they're exactly the same otherwise. You can try to negotiate the price down. It's a lot easier to do if the property is vacant or if the area is not super attractive. Um, but usually it's not considered polite in Japan to offer less than 10%. So really low ball offers might offend the seller or the agent might not even take that offer to the seller and they'll pretty much label you a tire kicker and not want to work with you down the track. So it's okay to do if you don't mind missing out on that particular property or on that particular relationship with that particular agent. Um, but otherwise, if you are keen on that property or you've got a good relationship with that realtor, at least have a conversation with them before you uh, pen down an offer that's lower than 10% because it is considered quite unusual in Japan. So the fact that we mentioned most of them, um, foreigners are difficult to deal with um, unless you're dealing in very foreigner friendly areas, which there aren't that many of in Japan. You should be ready to um, accept an occasional death in the property. Otherwise, you can avoid all elderly tenants, but that's pretty much shutting off um, half of your tenant base. Get ready to deal with a whole lot of paperwork. There's no electronic signatures. You'll often need to, uh, you'll often be required to travel to have a signing meeting or to carry uh, suitcases of cash with you for settlement. Um, there are ways to get around that, but generally, if the uh, agent you're working with is not that used to dealing with foreigners and is more a member of the old school, uh, old guard of Japanese real estate um, industry agents, then you might have to deal with a lot of physical stuff. You do not raise the rent because salaries have not gone up. So rent hikes, minor rent hikes in very central locations in superbly renovated, beautiful properties. Generally speaking, rents like prices here tend to be stable and not to say stagnant. You cannot inspect, this is due again to the uh, Japanese tenancy laws, you cannot inspect a tenanted property. So 
while there's a tenant in the property, um, nobody, including the agent, the property manager, the seller, the buyer, nobody can enter a property. You only enter a property that's tenanted in Japan by the tenant's request. Um, you can definitely ask them, um, but they'll mostly refuse. Some of them might freak out at the question and just move out on you. So no interior inspection, which again is a little bit of a bonus if you're buying smaller um, one room or, you know, up to 20, 25 square meter apartment, there's only so much that you'll need to renovate in the interior. But if you're looking at bigger family homes, bear in mind that if you've had a tenant there for 10, 15, 20 years, if and when they move out, that could be quite a substantial renovation. And financing works a whole completely differently in Japan. So I know that most of the people listening to this are probably uh, residing in Japan. So we can get into that in the Q&A section if you want. But basically financing here is not based on your assets. They don't care about any income that you might have overseas. Uh, they only care about your stable and reliable salary or income history in Japan. So there's no drawing on equity. You're only going to be able to borrow up to seven times your annual salary, whether it's for your personal home or for investment properties, what have you. And the amount of assets that you have, um, nobody really cares about that. Financing is based only on your borrowing capacity and your payment capacity here, and not on any assets that you might be able to liquidate or the bank might be able to foreclose. They don't care about that. And I think that is it. Some income hacks. Foreign tenants can pay more. Uh, occasionally, especially if it's the uh, the ones that are finding it a little bit tougher to find a place, for example, international students, people who are here on an extended holiday or to um, to get into some, you know, very specific Japanese thing. Uh, monthly mansions, which are official tenancy leases done with a lease in place, but are for periods of time that are shorter than a year or two, which is a typical long-term lease. Those will also generate higher income. And then you get into the really hands-on business management type of hacks like shared homes, guest homes, shared offices, minpaku, which is short-term stay like Airbnb done without a lease and so forth. Those can, um, those can definitely bring up your income significantly, but they, then that becomes a lot more hands-on of an experience. So definitely not something that a uh, passive investor might want to do. Right, I've gone way over time. Go for it. Q&A. <laughs> All right, I was rushing a bit <laughs> towards the end there, just trying to be conscious of the allocated time slot, so sorry about that. But hopefully covered a lot of the stuff um, that first-time investors uh, or those considering investing here should be aware of. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, and again, the other presentations are available via this episode's description or comments or show notes, so feel free to watch them as well. And lastly, for our 10, 12 December event, again, meal-inclusive tickets are now available until 1 December room only or attendance only tickets might be available until the 8th but the uh, overnight stay tickets might run out before that if the hotel continues to become more and more booked as seems to be the case at the moment so do hop over to the event page check out the new speakers intro video and secure your spot today we're really looking forward to talking business life in japan design marketing and of course play some seriously awesome games now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com and he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku.